As we come on air tonight, San Antonio police have arrested the suspect accused of shooting and killing a man at a La Quintera apartment complex just last week. At 21 year old Sasha Scare is currently in the Bear County Jail tonight. She now faces a murder charge for the death of 34 year old Martel DeRuin. The shooting happened at the Towers apartment in the 16,700 block of La Quintera Parkway. According to the arrest affidavit, Scare was in a relationship with him at the time of his death. Police believe the two got into an argument which led her to allegedly shooting him through the door of his apartment unit. This all happened back on January 22nd. However, his body wouldn't be discovered until four days later when his estranged wife called police for a wellness check. Scare's bond tonight is set at $500,000. In other big news tonight, a deadly discovery. This afternoon, a woman walking on her property off Old Pearsall Road came across a truck with two bodies inside. The night team's Jonathan Cotto tells us what questions San Antonio investigators are trying to answer. She was walking the property here and noticed that there was a truck that was out of place. She approached the truck and became alarmed uh, to discover a male and a female inside. A call to police prompted this investigation near Old Pearsall Road. The property owner found the truck around 4 o'clock. SAPD officials say it appears to have crashed into the location. And ended up resting right there. Um, but again, it's it's preliminary, so that is part of their investigation to canvas the area and just see what they find. But investigators say there are many unknowns in this case. It's unclear how long they've been there. Um, like I said, uh, a property owner was walking this, this area right here, noticed the truck. Um, but we don't know how long they've been there. We don't know what relation, if any, they have to this area. What they do know is the man and woman inside the vehicle both seem to be in their 30s. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office is working to identify them. It's too soon to tell right now how they died, um, but that will be part of the medical examiner's investigation. As of now, SAPD has no person of interest. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Meanwhile, a second death and investigation tonight over on the east side, just a couple of blocks from the Alamo Dome. A man shot there in the back and police now searching for four suspects who they say attacked and killed him. That shooting happening around 430 in the 100 block of Omaha. Police say two men were sitting in a car when the attackers walked up and opened fire. At least 10 shots were fired. Those suspects then running off. Police tracked them to a nearby house, but when they went inside, the suspects weren't there. The victim taken to Bamsey where he died. Police say they are now working to find those four suspects. After four days, the manhunt is over for two brothers involved in the shooting of a Balcones Heights police sergeant. Today, the second suspect, Wilfredo Montemayor, was taken into custody. He joins his brother, Sihifredo Montemayor, in the Bear County Jail tonight. The night team's Jaffney Gray tells us how BCSO deputies were able to find him just one day after his brother's arrest. Unfortunately, because of your actions, a man nearly died. Do you have anything to say to him or his family? Well, we got him. Uh, we're happy to be able to bring Wilfredo Montemayor into custody today. With the help of several law enforcement agencies, the Bear County Sheriff's Office has been working around the clock in search of two men involved in the shooting of Balcones Heights Police Sergeant Joey Sepulveda. This afternoon, deputies had a sense of relief locating Wilfredo Montemayor, the accused shooter, at an apartment complex off Perrin Vital in Loop 410. Take a look at your screen. Here, you see Wilfredo with dreadlocks. When deputies found him, the suspect was wearing a mask uh, and, a, and a beanie hat pulled down low over his eyebrows. Eyebrows that gave him away despite shaving his head. That facial feature is what the SWAT officer knew 100% that he was dealing with, this, with the shooter. His brother, Sihifredo Montemayor, tried changing his appearance as well before eventually turning himself into Mexican police and being extradited back to Bear County. Unlike his brother, Wilfredo Montemayor had nothing to say as he was being walked. In fact, Sheriff Salazar confirming that lack of emotion, saying that he didn't show any while being questioned, calling that interview Tilling. An affidavit states while Sergeant Sepulveda and his partner responded to a car burglary involving the Montemayor brothers, Wilfredo allegedly shot Sepulveda multiple times before Sihifredo acted as the getaway driver, both facing a charge of attempted capital murder. Balcones Heights Police Chief John Jahanara saying the survival of Sepulveda is nothing short of a miracle. I think he's in a good place. Um, Definitely, there's a long road to recovery, but um, he's a strong individual. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. 
And the Bear County Sheriff's Office said more charges could be pending for the two brothers. Sheriff Javier Salazar said their family members may also be brought in as persons of interest for possibly helping the suspects. Reports of a tiger cub on the loose on the southwest side now under investigation tonight by Animal Care Services. SAPD was told of the alleged spotting of the cub yesterday just before 4 o'clock in the 8600 block of Elk Runner. That's where a homeowner says she saw the tiger cub walking around in the backyard. By the time officers made it out to the scene, it was gone. But a short time later, another homeowner apparently spotted the cub. Witnesses told police the Tiger Cubs homeowner was able to catch it and take it home. ACS now working to get a warrant to search that home, which is believed to have several other Tigers. Now to the latest COVID-19 numbers here in Bear County. Tonight, Metro Health is reporting 625 new cases. That brings our confirmed total cases to 181,011 cases. The seven-day moving average now sits at 1,147. 11 new deaths also were reported, bringing the death toll to 2,208. Taking a look at the hospitalization rate, it continues on a downward trend. Right now, 969 people are hospitalized tonight. That's down 30 from yesterday, with 373 in ICUs and 193 on ventilators. Mayor Nuremberg also gave a brief update on the COVID-19 vaccine distribution here in San Antonio. He says more than 10% of the population has been vaccinated. That equals out to about 155,000 residents. As always, you can find more vaccine coverage on our website. That includes how to sign up for your second dose with WellMed and finding out when the next batch of doses are expected to get here. Just head to ksat.com. Overwhelmed by support, that's how the family of Roberta Lopez is feeling after raising more than they need for funeral expenses. Lopez died last Friday in a two-vehicle crash on Highway 90. The family says she was on her way to work when that crash happened. Today, the family selling dinner plates to raise money. The money collected today will also help Lopez's five children she leaves behind. They range in age from 23 down to just three years old. The family hopes she's remembered in a positive light. The kind of person she was was very strong, very independent. I mean, she was just overall like a good person, honestly. We all loved each other and we all helped each other any way we can. The suspect in that crash, 29 year old Jeremy Voris, is charged with intoxication manslaughter. Right now, he is out on bond. A driver is recovering in the hospital after fire crews used the jaws of life to rescue her from a crash on the north side. The crash happened around 530 this morning on Highway 281 and Wurzbach Parkway. San Antonio police say the woman lost control of her vehicle while trying to avoid an object in the middle of the road. As a result, the vehicle slammed into a wall, trapping her inside. The driver was taken to University Hospital and is expected to be OK. SAPD investigating a shooting from this morning on the south side where two teens were shot. This incident happened near Theo and Malone just after 2 a.m. this morning. However, the two victims were found walking into downtown Baptist Hospital. The victims telling police a person shot them, hitting one teen in the foot, the other in the leg. Someone drove them near the hospital before leaving. There are no details on the suspect and no arrests have been made. Outside with live cam, it turned into a beautiful day after a cloudy start very early this morning. We had a frontal boundary come through, swept all the cloud cover away, and really left us with a very enjoyable Saturday. Hope you were able to get out and enjoy the beautiful weather. 50 our morning low up to 78 this afternoon. We had some drier air moved in, uh, move in, and that helped to boost our temperatures to near 80 degrees this afternoon. Tomorrow is expected to be a pleasant day. Not quite as warm. We'll go low to mid 70s for your high temperatures, but plenty of sunshine on the way for Sunday coming up. We'll talk about what today's breezy north winds could mean for the mountain cedar outlook over the next couple of days. A warming trend heading into early next week, but then a potential big cool down back half of next week. Your full forecast will be up in just a bit. Courtney. Thank you, Katie. What is the economic fallout from the pandemic locally and how is San Antonio moving forward? Those are just two of the questions we'll be asking the president of the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce, Richard Perez. It's part of our leading essay segment on GMSA. There's still time for you to submit your own questions. Just head to our website and click on the leading essay tab. 
A scary scene for two Texas teens learning virtually at home. What we know about the suspect who broke in, tied them up during an attempted robbery. Plus, the results from the 2020 census are coming soon, but how does this affect redrawing the district map in Texas? We'll explain in tonight's Case Out Explains Breakdown Booth. Well, there's some positive news in the fight against COVID-19. Cases of the virus and hospitalizations are actually on the decline. Yeah, some states are starting to ease COVID-related restrictions, but there are now concerns Super Bowl parties could become super spreader events. Here's ABC's Christine Sloan with the latest. Some encouraging signs in the battle against COVID-19. The post-holiday surge in cases is now on the decline. The number of hospitalizations dropping by 32 percent over the last three weeks, according to the COVID tracking project. But the death toll is still staggering. More than 461,000 Americans have died from the virus. 22,500 deaths reported this week alone. Across the country, mass vaccination sites are now open. According to the CDC, more than 39 million total doses of vaccines have been administered, 9% of the population receiving their first dose. But many are finding the process challenging. They didn't anticipate as many people coming and to keep the appointments in a timely fashion so they're back behind and it's raining and it's cold and I'm elderly. Johnson & Johnson applying for emergency use authorization of its single shot vaccine which showed a lower overall efficacy than the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. But the company says it is 85 percent effective against severe illness. We can be very confident that this vaccine, even as a single shot vaccine, uh, provides a very strong protection against severe COVID disease. And there were no hospitalizations or deaths. Amid the declining number of cases, some states have begun rolling back restrictions. Colorado allowing more people into bars, restaurants and gyms. And on Sunday, Iowa lifting its mask mandate and social distancing limitations for business and social gatherings. Christine Sloan, ABC News, New York. Thursday's weather had me feeling the spring vibes, and then I saw your <laughs> 5 o'clock weather forecast, and winter's pulling us back in. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> not over yet, Tim. Yeah, we've got some big question marks when it comes to next week's forecast, and we'll talk about that, but I wouldn't put your winter coats and stuff away just yet may need it in the week to come i think especially this time next weekend in the meantime beautiful day today love this time lapse we went from cloudy and a little bit of mist there and fog to sunny in a flash and we got to enjoy a lot of sunshine today 58 at the airport now our dew point is in the 20s very dry air winds north at 10 miles per hour uh, these winds were fairly gusty at times this afternoon we had some gusts up to 30 35 miles per hour but they have really relaxed since sunset and right now our sustained winds are just about 5 to 10 miles per hour even calm in places like Kerrville Fredericksburg and Carrizo Springs so breezy even gusty north winds at times today that could take our cedar count and keep it elevated into the day tomorrow. So you may be frowning because of mountain cedar tomorrow due to today's gusty north winds. Winds will become a bit more southerly tomorrow. That should allow the count to fall into Monday and again into Tuesday. But we'll have to see what that pollen count shows first thing tomorrow morning. Sarah Spivey will have that for you on the Sunday morning edition of GMSA. Otherwise, tomorrow will be very, very nice. A touch chilly in the morning, upper 30s, low 40s, low 70s though in the afternoon. So still very comfortable, not quite as warm as it was today. Winds becoming southerly 5 to 15 miles per hour. So tonight we're in the 40s and 50s across the board. Still in the low 60s there in Del Rio and in Catula. But with that dry air in place and some lighter winds, clear skies as well. Temperatures will drop down into the upper 30s for a lot of us. We could get close to a light freeze in a portion of the hill country, but I expect the majority of us to stay above freezing tonight. Low 40s down well to the south of Highway 90. Tomorrow afternoon with sunshine and dry air. A lot of us climbing back into the low to mid 70s, some upper 60s in the hill country over Overall, very comfortable tomorrow. As we get into Monday and Tuesday, the warmth will hang around. I'll keep us here in the 70s and 80s in South Texas, both Monday and then into Tuesday. But 
after we get past Tuesday, that's when the wheels kind of start to fall off as far as the forecast is concerned, and we start to see a big spread in our forecast models. We've got some cold air that is sitting up in the plains and Midwest tonight that's going to try to seep down into Texas sometime next week, but our forecast models are very split on exactly when that could happen. We've got one model here I'm showing you that brings this very cold air in Wednesday and Thursday. In fact, on Thursday, this particular model, the GFS model, has us in the 40s. But let's back up, rewind. Tuesday afternoon, a different forecast model keeps that cold air north of the Red River, has us in the 80s on Thursday. So we've got a 40 degree spread in our temperatures for Thursday next week. So we're hopeful that in the next couple of days we'll have some better model agreement. Bottom line, what I'm saying here is we could potentially uh, be looking at a big cool down next week, but we've still got to iron out the details. Now, some of you have been asking about uh, planting for the spring season. Our average last freeze is not until February 24th, so later this month, the latest freeze we've ever had. April 3rd, 1987. So still a lot of question marks middle and back half of next week. We'll keep you updated over the next couple of days. But like I said, I would just keep the winter gear handy because you could need it late next week, guys. All right. Keep the gloves out, too. <laughs> Tim has a, I, I refuse to Tim use has an array of gloves that I've seen. <laughs> Not going to use them. All right, uh, Spurs looking for a win in Houston tonight, Larry. Yeah, and we talk about the Spurs yeah, young players all the time, but let's yeah. not forget about DeMar DeRozan. The veteran is carrying the Spurs right now. He scored 30 points again tonight. That's the second time he's done that back-to-back -back games, the third time this season. And in college basketball, Roadrunners guard Javon Jackson is certainly a sharp shooter coming up. at the Rockets tonight and guard Derek White starting with Lonnie Walker the fourth sideline with a stomach issue. First quarter, Jakob Pertl blocks DeMarcus Cousins and the Spurs break out the other way. DeJounte Murray makes the jumper and one free throw good, capping off a 9-0 Spurs run. They led 16-7. Late in the quarter, Patty Mills drives and misses, but Devin Vassell is there for the putback and SA led 29-23 after one. Second quarter, opening seconds, White feeds Drew Eubanks for a monster slam dunk. I mean, he put John Wall on a poster right there. Back to long distance now, Rudy Gay from 27 feet, and it's good, 41-29 Spurs. After a Houston bucket, Spurs push it back. Murray passes to Patty inside the paint for an aerial layup at the buzzer, and the Spurs led 51-47 at halftime. Third quarter, Spurs shooting at the other end. Kelvin Johnson attacking the Ram count at and one three-point play from the Wild Mustang. Moments later, Patty steals the rock, back he goes, and he finds his rookie Vassell for a Saturday night jam and spurs up 10. Timeout rocket, spurs let 84-77 after three. Fourth quarter, tight game, DeMar makes a short jumper and gets fouled. Free throw good, spurs by five with a minute to go, and they win 111-106. to DeMar with a game high 30. He's having a wonderful year. He's been a great leader, you know, detailed in his approach to games. Uh, and he's been, you know, uh, our go-to guy, game after game after game. Spurs will come back home to host the Warriors Monday night at 7.30. Men's college basketball number six Texas is in a funk right now and Oklahoma State made sure they stayed that way. Second half tied at 51 Andrew Jones steals the ball for Texas and lays it in plus the foul three point play as UT goes up three. He led the horns with 17. 56 seconds ago Cade Cunningham makes a triple ball tying this at 59. That's your score heading into overtime. Tied at 65 in OT Cunningham steals the inbounds pass but misses the game winning layup and we're going to bonus period number two. But Cunningham would redeem himself with this three point dagger for a five point lead. The Cowboys both scored the horns 10 to tune overtime number two and they upset number six Texas 75 67 for the horns third straight loss. Number 13 Texas Tech on the road to Kansas State and Red Raiders guard Mac McClung dominated. First half he steals the ball then races back for the layup and one free throw good and it's eight to three Tech. Now tied at 21, McClung showing off his handles, then drives in for a contested shot. I mean, that was sick. Second half, Wagner alum Kevin McCuller from the baseline throws a deep inbounds pass to Mack for some icing on the cake slam dunk. McClung had a game high 23, and Tech takes it 73-62. McCuller with 15 points. 
UTSA closed out a two-game series of Florida International, and Roadrunners guard Javon Jackson had a monster first half. Tied at 13, Jackson makes a corner three, and UTSA would pull away after that. 2.16 to go, Jackson with a crossover, and then three, and he's feeling it all right, as the announcer says. UTSA leads 40-23. to Then at 132, he goes three ball again, nothing but net. He scored 20 of his 22 points in the first half. UTSA closes the half on an 18-2 run, and they go on to beat the Panthers 90-4 in Miami to sweep the two game series. Our Lady of the Lake at number five, Houston. The Cougars had an open date, and so the Saints stepped up. First half, Saints down five nothing when Ethan White gets the Saints on the board. The East Central alum, he scored eight points. Moments later, Jordan Embry hits a long corner jumper, and the Saints are down five to four. He had nine, but the Cougs would dominate after that, out shooting the Saints 55 to 25 percent. Houston wins 112 to 46. The Saints' first game in six weeks due to COVID-19 altering their schedule. And coming up later, college football. Trinity and TLU kicked off their spring seasons today. Guys, it's just kind of weird, you know, but it's cool. Yeah, brutal final score there for LLU. <laughs> but at least they got to play. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Next on the night, B, the countdown is on to the big game. How Super Bowl organizers had to adjust to accommodate COVID-19 safety protocols. Plus, a neighbor is a key witness to a case where two teens were tied up in their own home. We'll have that story for you next, right after this break. Welcome back. A Houston family is shaken up after a terrifying home invasion. Yeah, two teenagers were home alone taking online classes when they were confronted by a man with a gun attempting to rob the home. Houston police hope video captured by a neighbor will help lead to an arrest. Take a look. And I told him he saved my kids because I don't know what would have happened because we have nothing. Monica Peone is still emotional following the ordeal. What were you doing in the house? This is video of a man Houston police now trying to identify a neighbor quickly recording him after he saw him inside his neighbor's home. We haven't slept, you know, just scared. Why us? Why come in? It was Thursday afternoon. Mom was at work and her 16 year old son and 18 year old daughter were home alone taking their virtual classes when they heard a loud bang. And I called a neighbor and I said, hey, I don't know what's going on. My daughter texted me. She said someone's in the house. Can you please go see what's going on? That's when the neighbor who doesn't want to be identified said he saw the door broken in and this man casually coming down the stairs. The neighbor knew immediately something was not right. They had um, zip tied my son um, in the living room upstairs and they had my daughter wrapped up with a cord in her room. The 16 year old telling police the suspect pulled a gun on him, demanded money and property. He said he heard him talk in Spanish and heard three other male voices in total, but didn't see them. The daughter was able to text their mom just before the suspect tied her up with a TV cord. She said they, you know, did feel on her and everything and she was just shaking. I'm just grateful that they're okay and everybody showed up. My neighbor saved. Houston police say surveillance video in the area also captured images of the suspect. Both teens were not injured during the incident. More news out of Houston. A woman is dead following a road rage incident this morning. Houston police say the victim got into an altercation with another driver. That's when police say the suspect opened fire on the victim's car, hitting her at least four times. The passenger inside the victim's car was not injured. Police say the suspect drove off and so far no arrests have been made. An arson suspect is in custody in connection with the fire that destroyed the historic Mason County Courthouse earlier this week. Mason's about two hours northwest of San Antonio. The courthouse was one of multiple structures on fire Thursday night, according to Brady Fire officials. No one was hurt, but the courthouse was left in ruins from the inside, at least. The good news, all the records had been moved out of the building in preparation for renovations through the Texas Historical Commission grant. Disney World won't be hosting a Super Bowl parade down Main Street USA this year to, due to COVID. But even though the traditional victory parade is canceled, the iconic I'm going to Disney World TV commercial will not be sacked. Viewers will still see the commercial on broadcast TV just after the big game tomorrow. Disney now hoping to bring back the parade next year. While its Florida parks are open, Anaheim is still closed because of the pandemic. And tomorrow's game pits Tom Brady, the winner of six Super Bowl titles, versus Patrick Mahomes, the defending champ and former Super Bowl or last year's Super Bowl MVP. Only 22,000 seats will be filled with fans at Raymond James Stadium in Tampa. The NFL is inviting vaccinated health care workers to watch. 
Everyone in attendance will still be required to wear a mask, maintain social distance, and will receive a PPE kit. Tickets will be digital and all food and beverage transactions will be cashless. Well, before you start snacking during the big game tomorrow, the USDA is issuing a major recall. Nearly 7,000 pounds of ready-to-eat dip and salad products from Food Evolution were not inspected properly and may not be safe to eat. The taco dip in the 18 and 31 ounce sizes is being recalled and should be thrown away immediately. The eight ounce package of German style potato salad with bacon is also on the recall list. And lastly, the seven ounce tri-colored Italian style rotini pasta salad with salami is being recalled. California churches fighting the state's pandemic restrictions have received a partial victory from the U.S. Supreme Court. In a divided ruling, the high court blocked California's COVID-related ban on indoor worship in hardest-hit counties. However, justices allowed some restrictions to remain in place. Those include capacity limitations by percentage and a ban on singing and chanting during services. The legal challenges were brought by two churches, one in Greater Los Angeles and the other in San Diego. President Joe Biden is blowing away all predecessors out of the water when it comes to executive actions, orders and proclamations and memorandums compared to the executive actions of the last four presidents. Biden so far has already issued an entire term's worth of executive actions in just his first few weeks in office. A lot of what Biden has done so far is to undo what former President Donald Trump had put in place, like the border wall and rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, a ban on transgender people in the media, uh, in the military, and, and others. Still ahead, the KSAT Explains team talked about redrawing Texas districts and how this will play a role in future elections. Stay with us. It may not be the most exciting thing or something too many people rush to read about it, but it is incredibly important. And this week's episode of Case That Explains is all about redistricting. Later this year, the Texas legislature will take up the task of redrawing the lines on our state's congressional and legislative maps. Case That Explains producer Lexi Salazar steps into the breakdown booth to tell us a little bit about the show. So this week's episode of Case That Explains is all about redistricting. We know it's not the sexiest of topics and maybe you even think it's boring. You certainly would not be alone in that thought. But before you decide to skip out on this episode, hear me out. Later this year, the Texas legislature will be tasked with redrawing our congressional and legislative maps. They'll be able to do this after they finally get the results from the 2020 census. These maps determine how we're represented on the state level and at the national level. And if you've ever looked at the shapes that make up the map, you probably think that those shapes look pretty random. They look like nonsensical puzzle pieces. But here's the thing. The shapes aren't random. They look that way by design, of course, through the process known as redistricting. And it's not just an aesthetic problem. The strategic way districts are drawn could disenfranchise voters of color and dilute the impact of whole communities. Simply put, this is a really important process. And we hope in this week's episode of Case That Explains, we made it kind of entertaining. We even included Tetris. Our hope is that the Case That Explains team does for redistricting what Schoolhouse Rock did for bills. My only regret is that we didn't include a jingle to go along with the episode. KSAT Explains Redrawing the Map is available to stream on demand right now. You can find it at ksat.com slash explains or on the KSAT TV app, any way that you stream. Love it. Let's forward to checking that out. Live cam showing a clear night tonight. We're in the mid to upper 50s now. We should drop down upper 30s, low 40s uh, by early tomorrow morning. A big reason for uh, chilly start to your Sunday, clear skies, dry air and lighter winds. Check out the big spread between our air temperature 55 and our dew point 28. And compared to this time last night, our dew point numbers are down anywhere from about 15 to 25 degrees. Thanks to a weak frontal boundary that came through early in the day. So very dry air in place that's going to hang around tomorrow. But this does set us up for a chilly start to the day tomorrow. So if you need to get out early, get the doggos out for a walk, you will need a light jacket, upper 30s, low 40s to start your Sunday. Another look at a potentially cold forecast next week coming up.
we were just discussing in the break, there might be some people with some work to do in Tampa tomorrow regarding the cutout folks that they've put in the stands. Yeah, it might be really windy. You don't want those people blowing away. Yeah. I, I hadn't even thought about that. I guess they did need to do that today. They couldn't possibly do it all tomorrow. Uh, the weather in Florida today has been a bit rough. There's actually a tornado watch out for Central Florida, including Tampa Bay, also Orlando, up to Daytona Beach. That's that red box there. They've got some storms moving in from the Gulf of Mexico to the west, and some of these storms could be severe and uh, possibly tornadic. This tornado watch will go until 7 a.m. tomorrow morning Eastern time for this portion of Florida. However, it does look like things will clear out late tomorrow morning into early afternoon, and by the time we get to kickoff tomorrow for the big game, it should be mostly sunny in Tampa Bay with temperatures being allowed to climb into to the low 70s so it does look like timing is pretty good for the game but yeah i'm not sure about those cardboard folks hoping they may get a little yeah, bit a little, a little soggy yeah <laughs> better better than being real people that's for sure uh temperatures now in the 70s that they're in the sunshine state we're at 55 here in the alamo city but there is some very cold air up near the great lakes 17 in cleveland right now would you, you like the 55 better tim than oh, the yeah. 17 yeah oh, yes. Ew, yeah uh two below in omaha 11 below in Minneapolis. That's not what it feels like. That's the actual air temperature. So feeling a bit colder than that. And look at these temperatures up in Canada in the Arctic. 45 below, 47 below. Yeah, there's some very cold air uh, sitting up in the Arctic. This is already starting to spill down into portions of the U.S. And this very cold air is going to try to make a run at the Lone Star State early middle part of next week. Now, for folks in North Texas, this is a bit more of a sure thing. They're looking at this colder air dropping down. But for us here in South Texas, Timing is still a bit in question, uh, and I do want to show you just how how high the forecast uncertainty is as we get into the middle and back half of next week. So one model does bring the colder air south to San Antonio, puts us in the 40s by Thursday afternoon. That's I'm talking warmest will be is the 40s by Thursday afternoon. If you want to believe this particular forecast model, we'll go back to Tuesday afternoon, run it through again Wednesday into Thursday. You'll notice all that blue color stays north of the Red River for the most part into the central plains. This model holds off on bringing the cold air in until really the start of next weekend keeps us in the 80s through Thursday. So there's still a lot we've got to iron out with our temperatures as we get into the middle and back half of next week. There's certainly the potential that we could start to see some of that cooler air seep in middle of the week and then slowly filter in through Thursday and Friday, putting us into the 50s by Thursday afternoon. But there's still a lot we need to iron out. We're keeping a very clear close eye on forecast trends for you. And uh, of course, we're going to keep you updated. But some big things to keep in mind here. It does look like colder air will arrive sometime next week. Will that be Wednesday into Thursday or will it hold off into Friday in the start of next weekend? That remains to be seen. However, it does look like all things considered that colder air will get to us by next weekend, setting us up for a potentially cold Valentine's weekend. Bottom line, please keep checking back with us. We'll keep you updated over the next couple of days. Hopefully Sarah Spivey will have some better models, model data to work with tomorrow morning on Good Morning San Antonio, so you can get the very latest from her first thing in the morning. Another look at your Sunday 39 in the morning, so a bit chilly, but we'll warm into the low 70s. Overall, a beautiful day. Warming into Monday and Tuesday, or staying warm, I should say, with highs in the 70s, and then the potential for that colder air to start to move in middle to late next week. We will keep you updated, but <laughs> kind of like what I've been saying, just uh, keep everything nearby, the sunglasses, the <laughs> shorts, and also your scarves and all that. Yeah, that 48 and 46, possibly next week, still way better than what's going on up there in Cleveland. True. <laughs> Point snort. <laughs> uh, See, there we go. Yes, positivity. Yeah. All right, we're talking Super Bowl. Yes, Kansas City is now in Tampa as they get ready to uh, play Super Bowl 55 tomorrow. Of course, this is Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady. It's being billed that way, and Mahomes understands that. Plus, Trinity kicked off its spring football schedule today with a dub coming up.